You're listening to the Business Wealth Impact Podcast, your source for empowering information and cutting edge ideas from the world's top minds. I'm your host, Jean Amlor, founder of seven figure coaching company, Jean Amlor International. Join me on a journey to unleash your potential and create your highest success. Welcome to Business Wealth Impact. Hello, and welcome to another fantastic show of Business Wealth Impact. Today, we have Chuck Gallagher, who is a leading AI and business ethics speaker, author of six books, and a consultant. His work merges ethical leadership with AI, offering practical strategies for ethical decision-making in technology and business. Welcome, Chuck. Great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Oh, awesome. I'm so excited about this because ethics is one of my core values. And when you said you spoke about that, I thought, fantastic. Let's get you on the show. So Chuck, just tell us what got you into the whole ethics realm? Well, <laughs> I'd never started off thinking, oh, I'm going to speak on ethics. Uh, back in the 80s, I was tax partner in a CPA firm. I testified before Congress, written articles in national magazines, taught tax courses in 30 states. Life was good. but I hate to say it this way, but I was overextended and underfunded or had too much debt. And, and in a moment of weakness, when a banker called telling me I was behind in my house payment and thinking, oh, my God, I can't let him know that, that I can't manage my own financial affairs. I mean, that's not good for a CPA. I uh, embezzled money from a client. I paid it back. OK, shouldn't have done that. But I did it again and I paid it back. And. After a couple of times, it occurred to me, maybe I have my own private hedge fund. And so over the course of three years, created a Ponzi scheme. By the way, didn't know what that was called at the time. Now I know because of Bernie Madoff. And um, hmm. three years later, it collapsed on me. And that was the beginning of a, a new iteration of Chuck Gallagher and the work that I do. Mm, okay. So what you did was you decided to create your, be a bank. You decided, hey, I'm just going to take that money, use it, and then pay it back. So one point, I'm curious, how much money had you taken from your clients? Well, the first was 2000 paid it back. The next was a little more. Over three years, it was $254,000. Wow. Okay, now how did you get caught? Okay, that was easy. When you create a Ponzi scheme, I mean, I know this is not the purpose of this, but when you create a Ponzi scheme, you're dealing with other people's money. And as long as it's coming in, yay, you can sustain it. But when it goes out, unexpectedly, it's a problem. So I had a client call me when I was teaching a tax course in Idaho, of all places, who said, oh, something's changed in my life. I need my money now. Mm. And God knew and I knew it wasn't invested on his behalf. It was invested in me. And that was like mm. pulling the card out of the house of cards. That's the day when everything collapsed. Okay. So you were actually pretending that you were investing their money in something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. So you were more than an accountant because accountants don't usually invest people's money. Well, I was, yes, that is true. I was tax partner in the firm. I was more than an accountant. I was very creative. And so I creatively decided that perhaps if I was the person they trusted to invest mm -hmm. their money, I could uh, live off of other people's money until I made enough to purportedly pay it back. Wow. I think it's amazing. We just taught people how to start a Ponzi scheme, which was not our intention. <laughs> okay. This okay, is so supposed, now we're gonna, yeah, it's, <laughs> we're supposed to be talking about ethics. This is what you don't do. Okay. Just to be clear. <laughs> okay. X that everybody don't do it. Don't try this at home. But now we know how to do that in case I'm just joking, but you know, let's hear about what happened after that. Well, the, 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 the short version of the story for our time is Although I paid everyone back with interest, because I asked them, which, do you want me in prison or do you want your money back? And as mm. much as they hated me, they wanted mm. their money back. With interest. With interest. Yes. So I paid it back with interest, lost my license as a CPA, lost my interest in the partnership. Uh, my life, my wife's life and I together just collapsed to kind of nothingness. Mm -hmm. And the local DA said, he's lost everything. I don't want to prosecute. But the federal government mm. said, no, not quite. You've got mm. too much national notoriety. So on October mm -hmm. 2nd, 1995, I marched my happy butt into federal prison, became 11 058 a convicted felon and an inmate. How long were you there? Uh, I was sentenced to 18 months active and then three years mm -hmm. of probation. So how long did you serve? Well, in the federal system, you serve 85% of your sentence. So it was a little over 16 months. Okay. Wow. Okay. Not fun. No. Right? 
Everybody says, Nothing. oh, you went to Club Fed. It is a club. No. I'm part of the Bureau mm-hmm. of Prisons now. And it was <laughs> Fed. That's true. Mm-hmm. But nothing about it was fun. No, no, of course not. But so you were actually known nationwide as an accountant, like teaching people stuff? Yeah. And let me just be practical. I mean, as, as an accountant, it's not like I was an influencer as people are today. Right, right. But when you teach in 30 states and you've written articles in national magazines and you've testified before the House Ways and Means Committee, mm-hmm. you have some national notoriety within your circle. Okay. So the irony does not escape me here. So then what happened? You did your time. And then what happened after that? Well, Okay, let's just be candid. Nobody wants to hire a convicted felon, right? Right. So I I took the only job that I could find at the time that was selling cemetery property door to door. Mom always said death and taxes. I screwed up taxes, so I figured death was the next best alternative. And they were the only ones that would have you, right? They were the only ones that would have me. Yep. And then I'm guessing you did quite well with that. Well, here's the thing. I learned early on, you really need to be very good at what you do. And if you are, people will reward that. Well, I'm coming out of federal prison on a commission sales job, and I would be the easiest person to let go because I'm a convicted Mm -hmm. felon. So Mm -hmm. I decided I better be good at it. So in nine months, I was their top salesperson. Uh, Mm -hmm. They asked me, could I manage other people and teach them? And I said, yeah, if you let me hire some convicts. No, I really didn't say that, but (laughs) we're all good workers, let me just say. Um, But (laughs) That location became a top performing location. Then they asked if I could handle 13 locations. And I said, sure. And so all during the steps of that, I was cognitively aware of, and they knew it, it wasn't I hid this, that I was a convicted Mm -hmm. felon. So I better be good or Mm -hmm. I could be on the street. Right. Okay. So you were always good at what you did, but now you just had to be doubly good because your life was on the line. Well, I mean, your livelihood. Sure. Okay, so you did all that. And then along the way, you must have repented to then go the other way and talk about ethics. When did that happen? Well, a decade following my release, I was released in 96, a decade following 2006, someone came up to me and he said, how can you be a convicted felon? And at that point, I was a VP in a public company. <laughs> okay, So how can you be a convicted felon and a VP? That just doesn't seem to make sense. I mm. responded with, every choice has a consequence. I made stupid choices in the 80s, which in the mid-90s put me in federal prison. I made better mm-hmm. choices in the mid-90s, which by 2006 allowed me to be a VP in a public company, even though I was a convicted felon. And they mm-hmm. said, well, you should speak about that. Mm. And that was the, that kind of spark that said, okay, I've had enough time following the stupid stuff that I did and the time in prison. I've had enough time to be able to legitimately say, I now understand how smart people make dumb choices. And Mm. I am, I enjoy speaking and am intelligent enough to be able to share that message so that perhaps people can understand what to look for and maybe how to prevent people like me from doing stupid things. Mm. So preventing themselves from doing stupid, like it's to help the ethics is that we don't do stupid things yeah. that are borderline unethical that get you into that gray, into the black zone, right. right? Yeah, because I mean, here's the truth of what happens. Everybody thinks they're ethical till they're mm-hmm. not. Okay. Right. So the question is, if you are running a company or if you're listening to this podcast, what, what would cause someone, I mean, I'm, I've got a master's degree in accounting. What would cause someone reasonably smart to do what I did? And the answer Mm -hmm. is, as long as your life is going well, when I say, well, Mm -hmm. everything's in balance, Mm -hmm. Uh, your income is is good, Uh, your relationships Mm -hmm. are good, your health is good. Those are the three primary triggers. If everything's Mm -hmm. good, yay. But when something gets out of balance, instead of thinking from our frontal cortex, we go back here to lizard brain. Mm -hmm. And then we react to things without thinking. And so maybe, maybe if somebody understands what to look for before we go into reaction mode, Mm -hmm. not only can we ourselves stop ourselves from doing something stupid, but maybe we can recognize in someone else I can help you. I can intervene. I can help you see Mm. you may be not going down a really good path and we might want to rethink this. Mm. Okay. So what are some of those things that you teach people to look for when it's, yeah, 
You know, going to that space that's not a good space. So think about this for a second. And and I don't know your work history, but but at mine as a VP, and I'm a VP in a public company today, um, mm-hmm. there have been years when you would walk the floor, for example, and people would be at their cubicle or what have you. And you've heard someone, you, you can't call me here. Uh, the, mm-hmm. the check's in the mail. You can't call me here. That, this, you, uh, well, there's a financial problem. You just yes. heard it. I don't need to know what it is but I know that it is. And Mm -hmm. so if there's a financial problem, that's a trigger point that would give me an indication. Maybe I need to intervene or help them recognize, don't do something stupid. Or Mm. I come to work one day and you look at me and say, Chuck, man, you don't look so good. And I say, well, my wife left me. Mm -hmm. She's tired of me being on the road. She says, I'm never with her. She left me a note. Suitcase is gone. Closet's empty. I'm Mm -hmm. not going to be thinking correctly because the relationship has changed. Mm -hmm. Or I could come along, which happened to me in 2004. I go to the doctor and they say, we're going to do a blood test. You know, you need testing done. And they came back and told me I had prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a health issue. So I can promise you After I got the diagnosis, I was sitting there at my computer and I had two monitors, you know, side by side. Mm -hmm. And one of them was just Google searches of what is new in prostate cancer, whatever. Research, yeah. Yeah. So was I totally focused on my job? No. 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 Any of those trigger points could be things that could, could, operative word, cause someone to get off track. I want to do what Mm -hmm. we can do to keep them on track. Okay. And what are some of those things to keep them on track? Well, Apart from monitoring other signs in other people, what about self? I, I believe in self-monitoring, you know? So if I'm doing a presentation to a group, this is typically what will take place. We'll go over these and talk about it. And invariably, somebody will come up to me after the fact and um, because I'm pretty vulnerable and, and therefore they feel they can be vulnerable back. And they share with me things that have taken place in their life or that are taking place. But because we took the genie out of the bottle, because Mm -hmm. they see now those things that could be trigger points, they can look now introspectively in their life and say, oh, crap. Yeah, Mm. I've thought about that. Or I've considered. Let me give you a quick, simple example. Okay. Would you do something unethical? Most people would say no. Do you think Mm -hmm. voluntarily breaking the law is unethical? Most people would say yes. Good. Mm-hmm. Have you driven on the highways in the past two weeks? Yes. Did you speed? Yeah. Wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you just broke the law and you said that's unethical, but you wouldn't do something unethical. When we mm. get to the place where what we do seems to be socially acceptable and mm-hmm. in socially acceptable, there is no immediate consequence, we'll tend to do that over and over. Now people mm. will tell me, okay, look, I still may speed, but I'm now conscious of the fact. I am choosing to do that. It's not just yes. a behavior that's happening that I have no responsibility yeah. for. Mm-hmm. Now, the other thing is this. We have to go beyond the law because some laws for me are not ethical. Sure. Just because it's legal. So when I'm talking to people, I'm like, you need to do whatever it takes to grow your business if it's not illegal, immoral, or unethical. Because just because it's the law doesn't mean it's ethical. A lot that's of true. laws I feel are not ethical. So there's that thing. And if you're speeding, well, okay, you're speeding a bit. It's against the law, but maybe there's nobody else on the road. There's no chance you're going to have an accident. So maybe it's not so unethical because there's nobody around and what possibly could happen. So I think that people need to feel, think for themselves also about, oh, well, it's legal. And people have said that to me. I'm like, yeah, okay, it's borderline legal. Still not ethical just because you found a loophole. Right. So I think the whole way we're thinking has to change that we're not always just trying to get around or get away with stuff. I think that's the problem is people are always just trying to see where the loophole, that kind of thinking in and of itself isn't great because you're just looking for that. Do you know what I mean? It's a mindset. It is a mindset. And I have people will, will, you know, vehemently argue with me. It's like, well, but this, it's the ethical thing to do. It may be illegal, but it's the ethical thing to do. And it's like, you know what, here's the thing. I get that. I don't disagree. I think there are some laws that are stupid. We could go to any state Mm. and look up old laws from the 1800s, and there's some dumbass Mm. things there. I mean, hysterically Mm. stupid. But when when push comes to shove, the biggest issue is, is ethical 
if I am willing to be unethical, which may not be illegal, but if I'm willing to do that and therefore it creates a repetitive pattern, there Mm -hmm. is a reasonably good chance it will evolve into illegal somewhere. And even if it's not illegal, it still may create a consequence that we ultimately don't want. I'll give you an example. You're younger than I, but it would not have been unusual at all in my baby boomer days Mm. for uh, people to have a relationship at work. Okay? Not that crazy. A lot of people have, you know, divorced a spouse and met someone else at work and so forth. Mm -hmm. I get it. But in the world we live in today, from an ethical perspective, the expectation Mm -hmm. today is that don't happen without a consequence. So you can be the CEO of McDonald's and enter into a consensual relationship, Mm. which both parties say, I'm not exercising anything over you or vice versa. It's consensual. Mm -hmm. We know what we're doing. But the board of directors says it is not by Mm -hmm. our standards, the ethical Mm -hmm. thing, because the appearance Mm -hmm. is enough to cause us a problem. See you later. You're gone, CEO. Exactly. So the other thing is, I feel sometimes that people don't even have a compass of what is ethical from their upbringing or, and I'm astonished sometimes. I'm like, they think that's ethical and you can see they think it. So it really has to do with like background, culture, family culture, um, personal beliefs, and things like that, because, That's you true. know, what is ethical? Like, just because it feels like it's not ethical doesn't mean it's not, doesn't mean it is ethical. So you have to teach people. And of course, there is a great, the, the speeding one is a good one. Because, hey, you know, I'll admit I speed sometimes. You know, um, I'm sure everybody does speed up a little bit. It's not like consistent. But I think if we're late for an appointment, we're going to probably speed a little bit, aren't we? Yep. No, not breakneck speed, but most people are going to be like, well, I'm going to be late. I better just go a little faster than I would have, right? Right. So that's a very interesting one because most people would not think of that as being ethical or not ethical. They think more about, are you ripping people off? Um, how are you selling? Like there's un- very unethical sales. Um, so I guess there's actually different pockets of ethics, like business ethics, real life ethics, family ethics, friends ethics, right? Well, there are. And, and the world that we live in today is, as you know, incredibly fast paced. I mean, you and I 10 years ago right. could not have even done this because right? technology makes it easy and accessible. But what it also does is it increases the speed at which uh, choices take place and it gives people the ability to uh, choose in the moment with the emotion that they feel to make a choice. Uh, Mm. social media is beautiful for this. I mean, for God's sake, one thing that happens and instantly everybody has an opinion and easily and quickly willing to just skewer you (laughs) if your opinion happens not to be their opinion. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a time where number one, that didn't exist. You didn't have that voice. The voice was Mm -hmm. owned by the newspaper or Walter Cronkite on CBS at six o'clock at night. And if you wanted to skewer somebody, you did it in, to their face. And mm. if you did, they might smack you. So you thought <laughs> about what you were going to say before you opened the trap. So it goes back to consequence. It does go back to consequence. Yes. And, and in the world we live in today, uh, I'm not saying there are no consequences. There are severe consequences, mm. but uh, it's easier to become lulled into this is just the way things are. And it's okay as long as there isn't an immediate consequence. And and I will say this, because I think it's kind of funny. Um, I mean, I hate, I, I like using Waze as my GPS. Mm-hmm. Okay. Why? Because it says police reported ahead. And what <laughs> do we do? Slow, Slow down. Slow down. Consequences. Because we know that we don't want a ticket. But as soon as mm. police aren't reported ahead, we just pick it back up to nine under because under nine, you're fine. Over nine, you're mine. <laughs> oh, you're saying, is there a thing that you can go nine miles over the, the, the speed limit? Supposedly. But that's a function of, is it at the end of the month and the police officer hadn't had enough tickets? Because if it is, you're toast. No, because I saw, I, I got a, a speeding ticket once and it had all the different levels and five miles over, there was already a ticket. Oh yeah. So I thought, Oh yeah. Five miles. Cause it's a lo- Yeah. Well, I don't have ways. So 
I don't get the reports of the police. <laughs> I'm I just, so sorry. <laughs> no, I, I just try to do the right thing anyway without that. You know okay. what I'm saying? I got I, you. I'm not, I should get it. <laughs> but um, no, well, there actually used to be CB radios. Remember the CB oh, radios? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they would tell each other, hey, there's cops and they would warn. Oh, yeah. And they, in certain places, they made those illegal because they didn't want people to know and report that there were police. But actually, it shouldn't be illegal just to give information like that. Well, See, yeah. I agree with you as well, but I do remember the days when I went to college, I had a CB radio mm-hmm. and, and that was a cool way of communicating. And you would hear the trucker say, there's a smoky ahead. And it was like, <laughs> okay, that means there's a cop. I better slow down. Right. Okay. So how do you dig into this? How, how do you help people to be more ethical? I mean, that's really the question. How can we be more ethical or figure out that maybe we're not being ethical when we think we are and we really want to be? How do you help people with that? Part of that is uh, just recognition. Recognition of uh, what do we do? It's it really two parts, quite frankly. What are the trigger points? And the, and the big trigger points, mm-hmm. everything will fall beneath these three, but it's financial, relationship, health. Because mm-hmm. most anything that's ever happened, mm-hmm. if you peel back enough layers of the onion, you'll find that there is something inside that would cause that person in their mind to think what I'm doing is okay. So it's justification, justification of the actions, right? Like for you, you started your Ponzi scheme because you had some financial stress going on. Was that it? That, that is absolutely correct. It was two parts. Mm-hmm. It was financial stress and fairly stated, not that it had anything to do directly with my wife, but I was not willing to tell her we can't afford X. So if the relationship we're going to maintain as I thought it should, if she said, I need X, or I've gone out and bought something, you need to put money in the Mm. account. The relationship helped, didn't say it's the only reason, but helped motivate me to then say, okay, wow, there's a financial challenge. I've got to do something quickly because I can't go home and say, Honey, we don't have the money. Ah, I wasn't strong enough. Okay, so so there was also a, a problem in the relationship because we should be able to say that, right? Sure, absolutely. Okay, so and it's interesting that you can just put you didn't have credit available for two thousand dollars. Wasn't that much money? Well, at that point, I had exhausted all my ah. credit. So, I, as I said, overextended, underfunded, or had too much debt. Mm. And by the way, as a side note, just because of the conversation we're having, think about this for a second. Uh, we just came through a pandemic. You and I have just lived through something that other, unless you were born in 1918 and you're hundred and some years old, right. we're the only people on the planet that have gone through this. Right? right. Because the last time was the Spanish flu, wasn't it? That's correct. Right. Yeah, 1918. Mm-hmm. So we weren't around then, but think about it. The pandemic created financial challenges for a number of people. Yes. It created relationship challenges for a number of people and it created a health challenge technically for everybody. Right. So it literally, we have come through the trifecta of trigger points, Mm. which means it became easier for people to think, well, this isn't fair. I need to do X. And now we're starting to see at the corporate level and larger companies, a proliferation of fraud that's been caught in a multitude of ways because we went through the trifecta of triggers. Okay. I did not know that. There's actual, there's been more fraud because of the pandemic yep. that's now be. Wow. That is mind blowing. Okay. I didn't yep. know those numbers. So interesting. So you're proving your point that the stress causes people to say, well, I'm just going to do this and it's going to be okay. And maybe it's not the right thing, but I don't think they think they're being ethical though. Well, and think about it this. I, I was at a conference. Now, I'm going to tell you this really quickly. I was at a conference and I was looking at a financial conference and a lot of the guy, men there, they were arms folded, like, I don't Mm -hmm. need to listen to this crap. Mm -hmm. You know, I would never steal money. Mm -hmm. So I thought to myself, I need to come up with a different example to capture their attention. Mm -hmm. Now, I made this up. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to say this. I made it up on the spot, Mm -hmm. but I gave them a story. And I said, look, you know, I've been here a couple of days. It was in LA. Been here Mm -hmm. a couple of days. March Madness was playing. And I said, "Um, you know, the other day I noticed this guy, he's at the bar. And, uh, and this young lady comes up beside him. He was mm-hmm. watching the TV. I don't know, Duke was playing or Carolina mm-hmm. or somebody. It didn't make any difference. But this young lady comes up beside him and, and sits down and they strike up a conversation. Now, in his case, he'd been married for 16 years, come to find out. And life wasn't what it used to be. It used to be he'd mm-hmm. come home and his wife would 
greet him and they would go make mm-hmm. love and everything else happened after that. Mm-hmm. Now she come, he comes home. It's like, have you seen the yard out there? It looks <laughs> like crap. I mean, you need to mow the grass. This is ridiculous. I don't want the neighbors. Blah, 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 blah. So life wasn't what he wanted it to be. Okay. So what did he want? His need was he wanted to be the stud, feel that he was a stud muff and he used to be. Mm -hmm. So this young lady comes up, sits down at the bar. They have a conversation. Turns out she was from North Carolina. Mm. It's loud and noisy because of the basketball game playing. So she says to him, she says, by the way, she said, I've got a suite upstairs. She said, why don't we go up there and order a bottle of wine and we can watch the game there and and it'll be much more comfortable to Mm -hmm. talk. So he's thinking, okay, need. I want to feel like a stud muffin. Opportunity. Here she is. We're in Los Angeles. I live back in the Carolinas. Mm -hmm. Uh, Who's going to know? Rationalization. Mm -hmm. What you do in Mm -hmm. Vegas stays in Vegas kind Mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. So I use that example. Right. And after this course was over, this guy comes up to me and he said, who told you? (gasps) I said, what are you talking about? I forgot about it. He said, who told you? I said, but what? About the bar. And I was like, holy crap, I hit a pulse on something. I mean, but the point to it becomes it isn't necessarily stealing. It's just that mindset of, well, I can cheat. Who's going to know? That's where you start to have to pull back the layers of the curtain and think, okay, if I understand how it works, at least the genie's out of the bottle. It would be hard for somebody to go through my course and then think I'm going to cheat on my wife or cheat on my husband and not think about, holy crap, I remember Mm. that example. Mm. Now, they still may do it, but they're doing it consciously, not subconsciously. Right, right. It's not like denying it and saying everything's fine. The other thing thing is lying. People think it's okay to lie, like just about everything. I'm like, no, lying is wrong on so many levels, but from a moral point of view, you shouldn't lie. From an ethical point of view, sh- certainly shouldn't lie. From a legal point of view, shouldn't lie. Yep. And actually, there's a book called Lying, and it, it goes into how bad lying, and it's not from like a religious or moralistic point of view even. Actually, Elon Musk was recommending that as one of his top reads last year, I think. It's, it's destro- destructive to lie yep. to yep. yourself, to everybody around you, because you can't even trust yourself. And yep. I think that lying is something that I've noticed in my lifetime has become universally accepted. Yep. And you see it in the media. In the media, because I'm very conscious about what kids are watching, my kids are watching. And I said to them, it's so interesting. Every single show or movie or anything that has kids and parents, the kids lie to the parents and you're supposed to laugh at it. Mm-hmm. And also yep. not just that, most of the comedies, everybody's lying through their teeth and it's so funny. We, we are basically training a culture to lie and laugh at it. Like it's just no big deal. But the worst thing is that in every single kid's anything, they're lying through the teeth to the parents and you're laughing at the parents because they don't know. So unethical. Yeah. It's also unethical to produce things like that nonstop. (laughs) I was on a podcast probably a month ago, just like this, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm on this podcast and I have to assume the lady that was, was doing the interview uh, had a daughter, I'm guessing by seeing this girl, she was about mm-hmm. five years old. But anyway, mm-hmm. uh, mom had put the phone out somewhere, not in the room where the podcast was taking place. Well, the phone rings, mm-hmm. right? Yes. So so the little kid loves a phone ring. And so they yep. answer the telephone. And right in the middle of this interview, she, the little kid comes busting in and says, Mommy, you've got a call. <laughs> and instinctively, the lady on the podcast, we're talking about ethics, said, tell them I'm in the shower. Right. I'm like, we're on a podcast. We're talking about ethics. And you just taught your daughter to lie for you instead of saying, I'm on a podcast. I can't talk right now. Actually, there was an article in the New York Times years ago, years ago. I think, and they were, they were basically saying that most parents will lie in front of their kids about the most stupid things. Yes. Like, it just, the, the thing about the phone, tell them I'm not here. The kids are hearing. And then they wonder, they said they were astounded that the, the parents were wondering why their kids were lying. Now, yeah. obviously, some kids lie anyway because it actually can be genetic. Did you know that lying can be genetic? I am not surprised. Yeah, like especially pathological lying can be a genetic thing that's passed on. So sometimes it's not the parents' fault. But they they were the studies were like saying how astounding it is that parents are like, why is my kid lying? Well, you just lied on the phone about this, 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 and this. You lied when you were in the shop. They don't even see it as lying. It's like, well, it's just a white lie. There's no such thing as a white lie. A lie is a lie is a lie. Right. You know, some right. are more dangerous because it's actually har- harming people. 
but the white lies harming yourself. Anyway, yeah. that's just my point of view. So listen, Chuck, this has been amazing so far. Tell me, what is one thing that you want to leave the audience with as far as like your philosophy of life or mindset after all you've been through? Well, I would say this. I'm I'm honored to have the opportunity to talk with organizations about ethics, but the one thing that typically really uh, is heart touching to the group is this statement: "Your history does not create your destiny." Mm. So many times people come up and say, "But for the grace of God, I could have been in federal prison, or I have this problem or that problem." We have the opportunity as human beings to be a victim or a victor. Mm. That is a choice. Mm -hmm. So. I can't change the fact I'm a convicted felon, mm -hmm. but I don't have to be defined by those words. Mm -hmm. So I choose my history. I choose to use my history to create my destiny as mm -hmm. a vic victor, not a victim. Very good. And also, you know, people around us, when they see that, that we've turned, you know, we've turned over a new leaf. People, I think yeah. generally they're very forgiving, that they see some repentance or remorse or anything, something. So people are like, well, this guy's reformed himself. We're good. You know, I have a friend that was in prison. I don't hold it against him. He, he he's good. You know, he's like, I, I was doing some really wrong stuff and I'm out and he's a lovely guy actually. So yeah. I think when you're around good people, they, they're forgiving about somebody if the person's reformed. So very good words to live by that your history is not your destiny. You can change it any time. I completely agree. Well, Chuck, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for turning up. And thank you for the people that are listening. Please subscribe, share this, and take care. You're listening to the Business Wealth Impact Podcast, your source for empowering information and cutting edge ideas from the world's top minds. I'm your host, Jean Amlour, founder of seven figure coaching company, Jean Amlour International. Join me on a journey to unleash your potential and create your highest success. Welcome to Business Wealth Impact.